Just a quick content warning. This week's episode has some slight adult themes. Check out the post on mythpodcast.com for more information. This week on Myths and Legends, it's the beginning of the Trojan War, in that we get into the backstories of a lot of people involved with the Trojan War. You'll see how a centaur that runs an ancient Greek hero daycare is also a fantastic matchmaker, and how Hera heads up the party planning committee and leaves one person off the guest list, leading to the doom of thousands. The creature this week is a fearsome 200-yard dragon who lives in a cave and just wants to be left alone. Seriously, leave it alone. That's why it's in the cave. This is Myths and Legends, episode 132, The Wars to Come. This is a podcast where I tell stories from mythology and folklore. Some are incredibly popular stories you think you know, but with surprising origins. Others are stories that might be new to you, but are definitely worth a listen. Previously on this podcast, Hera, Athena, Aphrodite, Hermes, Poseidon, and basically all the Olympians tried to overthrow Zeus by tying him to his couch during a wine nap. It did not go well, especially when Thetis came to his rescue, dredging up a creature from the underworld to free him. Angry, Zeus punished the main conspirators, his wife, Hera, and her son, Hephaestus. He strung Hera up, stretching her out with some anvils, and threw Hephaestus off the mountainside, breaking his legs in the process. Today, we're not starting on Olympus, but in another place, one arguably as famous as the mountain of the gods itself, Troy. Hecuba staggered back in terror. Troy was burning. She stood before it as her husband, Priam, and her son, Hector, not yet five, were consumed by flames along the walls. They all screamed out to her. The torch that lit the blaze had come from her. Why had she done this? This was all her fault. She turned to run to the hills, but they, too, were set ablaze. The temples, too. Fire consumed her entire world. The only thing louder than the shrieks of those she loved was the sound of her home crumbling down around her in piles of ash. Then, she woke up. She felt her forehead covered in a heavy sweat and the baby kicking within. Priam sat next to her in bed. He had been shaking her, trying to wake her from the apparent nightmare. She had been screaming in her sleep. Again, was it the same dream? Hecuba nodded groggily and Priam embraced her. They needed to go talk to her son. Hecuba was the queen of Troy, and, with her husband Priam, she had given birth to 19 children. She had spent the better part of three decades basically pregnant, and though she had many children, she had never had dreams about any of them bringing about the destruction of their home. This was something new. One of those 19 kids was Asakus. He was one of their older sons, an seer. That morning, King Priam went to him with a question. If, say, one of the royals was, I don't know, having a dream in which they saw Troy burn and the torch came out of them like a baby and they also happened to be pregnant. What could that possibly mean? Isakas looked his father in the eyes for a moment then replied, if someone was having the dream that you described and they were pregnant, then that would be very, very serious. It would mean that a child was about to be born that would ruin their country and that child must be killed. Priam laughed nervously. Oof, good thing that this was just a complete hypothetical situation and no one was having those types of dreams. Great little thought experiment here. Good talk, kid. He'd see himself out. But the conversation stuck in Isakas' mind, even after his father left. Over the next few days, he consulted all the methods he had for divination and they all came up with the same indication. Doom. Doom for Troy if this child entered the world. Privately, Isakas met with his father but Priam refused to share more. Isakas met his father's eye. The blood of what happened next would be on the king's hands. Still, Priam was just as surprised as anyone when, a few days later, a proclamation came down from the royal seer. Any royal child that was born that day must be put to death. The mother as well. Almost as soon as the edict came down, Priam's own sister went into labor. It was public, and it was impossible to ignore. If Priam publicly went against the order, he went against the royal seer, 
and the will of the gods. And so his sister, Scylla, and her baby were killed on that day. He wouldn't make the same mistake with Hecuba. He hid her away. And as soon as the sun began to set, he could nearly breathe. Then he heard the crying. It was child 20 for Hecuba, so the whole process went pretty quickly. Too quickly. The child lay swaddled, just as the last ray of sun faded beneath the mountains. Priam, however, was crafty. He surrounded his wife with people loyal not to the city or the gods, but to him and his family. They would be safe. But then he thought about it. The dream, the one that started all this, his wife had it. The very child that the gods had warned them of? It was here in his arms. He'd executed his own sister for the city, but he was going to keep this child for himself. But no matter which thought path he explored, he couldn't bring himself to kill his own boy. He just couldn't. And then he heard the bells. Priam rushed off with the child to the wall, where he looked down on his chief herdsman, Agelaus. The man had been out of the city all day, so he didn't know what was going on. He knew the safest spots in the wilderness surrounding Troy, and he knew the most dangerous ones. Priam quietly placed his son in the arms of the herdsman, telling him that something had happened, and this child needed to be left in a place from which he would not return. Agelaus looked at his king, and he looked at the child that was surely the result of an affair, or worse. The herdsman nodded. He could do that. Agelaus left the child outside a bear cave. And five days later, because this never seems to work out any time it's used in mythology, the child lived. He had milk on the edges of his mouth. So Agelaus could only assume that the bears were suckling him. He looked on the baby, and he didn't hesitate to put the infant in his backpack. Atalanta, the legendary hero, had been suckled by a bear too, and she had grown up to be one of the greatest heroes of her generation. Agelaus, the herdsman, wouldn't let one of those great names that would be sung across generations die out here in the wilderness. The gods wanted this boy to live, so he would live. As for the child's name, Agelaus was a simple man. He put the baby in his backpack, so he would name him Paris, which, as the folk etymology goes, comes from a similar Greek word. Their rhythmic travel lulled the child to sleep against his back, and Agelaus smiled. Someday, people all around the world would know the name Paris, and it would all be thanks to him. So, when Agelaus returned to the king, he brought him a dog's tongue, saying that this was all that remained of the baby. Even when Greek myths aren't tragic, they're tragic. Anyway, that's it for Paris this week. We'll now go to another character we've seen before. He was an Argonaut, who will go on to be the father of one of the greatest heroes of the Greek world. But for now... He's just having a really bad year. Peleus rode alongside King Acastus. He had no idea how things had gone so wrong. His wife was dead. Suicide. She'd hanged herself. And Peleus had no idea why. News had come just days after he sidestepped the advances of King Acastus' wife, Crethes. She knew that he was married. And yet, Crethes had pressed him up against a wall when the servants were out. He pushed her back, of course, and beelined for the door. He had been sent to King Acastus by the gods for purification, after accidentally murdering his father-in-law in the hunt for the Caledonian boar. See episode 76. He wouldn't be purified by King Acastus and then turn around and sin against the man in his own house. Besides... King Acastus was a personal friend. They had sailed together on the Argo. King Acastus had taken over for Jason's father after Medea tricked his daughters into cutting him up and cooking him. This was a really bad season for Peleus. And so after he received news of his wife, King Acastus wanted to cheer him up. He wanted to take the young prince hunting. It was weird for Peleus. King Acastus had been colder for the past few days. But now, as he laughed and joked with his attendants, maybe things would start to get better. Peleus rested his hand on his sword. No one really believed him, but he insisted that it was a gift from the gods, that it was magic. No one, though, could dispute its origins. It had come from Crete many years ago, long after its maker, the famous craftsman Daedalus, had fled with his son. Whatever came of this trip, Peleus could see that things were going to start getting better.
things were so much worse as Peleus woke up with a pounding headache in the small hours of the morning. He was young, so he didn't know that you should let the king win. Peleus didn't even know it was a competition. It certainly didn't help that. When he returned to camp and saw the king's attendants heaping his animals on the king's pile and laughing at Peleus, Peleus held out a dripping bag of tongues. For every animal Peleus killed, he took out his magic sword and cut out the tongue as proof. Those animals belonged on his pile. Thank you very much. King Acastus feigned outrage over the servant's deception and told them to start setting up a tent. It was time to eat and with a smile, he looked at Peleus. Drink up. So Peleus woke up alone, miles and miles in a wilderness that included not just giant animals, but the occasional hydra and stab-proof lion. Worse, his magic sword was missing. Then, in the distance, he heard galloping? He jumped to his feet and ran toward it. And then he spotted who exactly was galloping, froze, and immediately took off as fast as he could in the opposite direction. It wasn't a king and his attendants or a group of heroes killing whatever the monster of the week was, but centaurs. A lot of them. They spotted him cresting the hill at the first light of dawn and took off after him. Now, horses are faster than people. You might know this. So it's no surprise that determined centaurs are faster than heavily hungover princes who are missing their magic sword. In minutes, the young prince was surrounded by a ring of spears. And then the ring parted. The largest one, their leader, a centaur by the name of Chiron, trotted out into the center. He looked down at Peleus, and he smiled. The gods said they would find him here. As the centaurs lowered their spears, Peleus learned that Chiron had been searching for him. If you don't remember, Chiron is the wise, nice centaur, as opposed to the violent, rapey centaurs that make up basically all other centaurs. He runs the ancient Greek hero daycare. Anyway, Chiron explained that Peleus was a man with a destiny before him and it was already getting too late. Peleus had to get married. The young prince hung his head. He was married, until last week. Chiron nodded. Yeah, that was very tragic. How when Peleus projected Cretheus' advances, she had gone and told Peleus' wife the opposite, out of spite, and the woman hanged herself. Did Peleus know what else was tragic? The ancient Greek world. Seriously, nobody, except for maybe Perseus, got a happy ending. And... Right now, the fate of the Greek world depended on Peleus marrying the right woman at the right time. Average men could sit back and whine about their circumstances. Great men accepted what was given to them. Peleus thought about it. He had no home to go back to, no wife or children, and the most recent king friend had just left him to be torn apart by centaurs in the wilderness. What did he have to lose? Sure, he'd come along with the half-horsemen and figure out what his grand destiny was. Then... He hesitated. He only wished he had his sword that King Acastus had obviously stolen. Chiron grimaced. Yeah, well, he didn't steal it, but Peleus didn't want it back. The prince laughed. Yeah, he did. The sword was made by Daedalus. It gave the wielder success in any combat. That's why he was carrying a bag full of tongues. Chiron said, yeah, he was going to ask about that. But anyway, Peleus really didn't want it back. Chiron pointed to an area behind Peleus. See that giant pile of dung over there? Peleus nodded warily. Okay. See that tiny bit of gold glinting in the sunlight? Peleus' heart sank. Yep. He sighed and rolled up his sleeves. We'll be going from that dung pile right back up to Olympus. But that will be right after this. This week's episode is brought to you by Robinhood. Robinhood, the investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, and cryptos, all commission-free. So, even if you're a stock market newcomer, like me, you can invest for the first time with true confidence, while other brokerages charge up to $10 for every trade, which honestly kind of blows me away for how expensive that is, Robinhood doesn't charge commission fees, which means you can trade stocks and keep all of your profits. And... With clear design and easy to understand charts and market data, Robinhood lets you place a trade on a smartphone in just four taps. Over the years, I've thought about investing, but never really knew how to dip my toe in. Everything just seemed too complicated or like I needed to go downtown and meet with someone in a big building. This is just straightforward. I set everything up in less than 10 minutes. There are no commission fees. It really just makes sense. 
And Robinhood's giving listeners a free stock, like Apple, Ford, or Sprint, to help build your portfolio. Sign up at myths.robinhood.com. That's myths.robinhood.com. This week's episode is brought to you by Siren. Have you seen this dark and sexy TV series on Freeform called Siren? It's about a powerful and alluring mermaid, Ren, who mysteriously comes to shore in a small town called Bristol Cove. But she's no little mermaid. First episode, she straight up throws a man through a windshield to defend herself. And now, in this upcoming season, more mermaids have arrived. Is it for refuge or revenge? What are they looking for? On the show, mermaids are incredible shapeshifters who can avoid detection. When they're on shore, they take human form. However, they're still powerful predators on land or in the sea. I can't wait for the show's return on Freeform because it's so unpredictable and so action-packed. You haven't seen this on TV before, and you're going to want to check it out. It is a truly unique approach to the mermaid myth. Siren returns on Thursday, January 24th at 8 p.m. on Freeform. Don't miss it. Themis, the same god that had guided Chiron to Peleus in the first place, was working her magic again. She was the goddess of good counsel, and her next project was Mount Olympus. It was back to business as usual after the attempted coup against Zeus. Mostly, Poseidon and Apollo had been sent into exile in service of some king. Hephaestus had been chucked off a mountain and maimed, and Themis shuddered as she saw the queen of the gods, Hera, still hanging by her arms from one of her son's chains the anvils pulling at her ankles. Themis was no fan of Zeus. She still heard her son's screams every morning, but she was also no fan of chaos either. And when she didn't support the coup, she knew what she was doing. She was choosing the sociopath she knew over the ones she didn't. Poseidon as a leader might have been worse. Ares definitely would have, if anyone survived the civil war leading up to it, that is. By virtue of being one of the few who didn't betray him, Themis had his ear, and that was good, because something else was coming. A war that would divide the world as they knew it, and one that would draw battle lines, even on Olympus itself. A city was rising in the east. A wedding was coming, and a hero must be born. You'd think that Thetis would be held up as a hero. Thetis, of course, being the Nereid last week, who stole down to Tartarus to summon the hundred-handers that freed Zeus. And Thetis was held up as a hero. For about as long as it took Zeus to look at her and realize that she was very attractive. She had apparently earned Zeus's ire when, after he recovered from being very nearly deposed, he turned to the attractive Nereid and put his hand on her knee. She immediately turned away, and the king of the gods sneered. Fine, then. He didn't want to, anyway. The fates had proclaimed that any sunborn of Thetis would rise up and become far more powerful than his father. He had already eaten one wife. He didn't need that headache again. Then, the next day, the prophecy began to click into place. Themis, the goddess of good counsel, stood before the throne, and she had a request. Thetis, the goddess that recently rejected his advances, had to get married. Zeus scoffed aloud. Good luck with that. He had already tried, but Themis, the goddess of good counsel, shook her head. No, not to Zeus to a mortal. Zeus thought about it, and he grinned. Yeah, yeah, that would be a pretty cool revenge. She would marry a mortal. If she hated him, great. And if she loved him, even better. He'd grow old and die, while Thetis, an immortal goddess, would live forever with sorrow. Zeus looked back at Themis. That's some dark stuff. Great plan. That's why they called Themis the goddess of good counsel. Themis grimaced. Thank you? Anyway, the wedding should take place in the next full moon. And another thing? They needed someone to plan it. Zeus threw up his hands. So, Themis turned, revealing Hera, strung up so as to be directly in Zeus's eye line as he sat on the throne. Themis told Zeus what he already knew. Hera was Thetis's foster mother, and really the only appropriate person to put together the ceremony. Zeus flared his nostrils in a look of disgust. Fine, he barked. Like everyone knew, he couldn't kill Hera, even though he wanted to, he really wanted to, and he couldn't keep her up there forever, even though he wanted to do that even more. Fine. Cut her down. P. 
Helios chomped on his cereal as his centaur roommate flipped through the mail. Oh, that a wedding invitation? Peleus asked through a mouthful. Nah, it's a save the date card. Ah, cool. Who's getting married? You are, Chiron announced, and he passed the card over. You and the Nereid. So named because she was one of the fifty daughters of Nereus, the old man of the sea, and his wife, Doris, a sea nymph. But there was one tiny hiccup. Chiron continued, informing Peleus that he had it on good authority that his betrothed, Thetis, hated him, hated this match, and was right in asserting that she was way, way out of Peleus' league. Peleus swallowed hard. Huh. So, someone else then? Chiron laughed. No, Peleus didn't get off that easily. Chiron handed Peleus a suit that he had been knitting when he wasn't instructing hero toddlers how to kill with their bare hands. Peleus looked up quizzically from the homemade ghillie suit. Were, were these berries? Peleus sweated outside the cave as he waited for Thetis to come home so he could pin her to the ground until she submitted to him. This was their idea of how he should meet and win over his wife. Greek mythology was the worst. Chiron said that she came to sleep each afternoon in the heat of the day, in this cave. And, sure enough, when the day was the hottest and Peleus was the most uncomfortable, she pushed past the bush he was hiding in to make her way into the cave. Peleus slid out of the suit and waited until he heard her breathing regulate inside. He took three deep breaths and dove into the cave. Chiron said Peleus just had to best her, which meant overpowering her and pinning her to the ground. Peleus wasn't sure why this was so important, but when your wise centaur roommate tells you the fate of Greece hangs on your ability to win a wrestling match, you do it. As soon as his hand found her wrist, though, you learn why this was a feat, because her wrist ceased to exist, as Thetis transformed into fire. Peleus screamed something about the fate of the world as the fire burned his hands, and Thetis could tell that he wasn't going to let go. So she tried the opposite, water. I have no idea how Peleus managed that one, but he did, pinning her in one place until she turned into a lion and then a serpent. He'd been burned, nearly drowned, mauled, and then crushed by a serpent, but he still held on to her. Then she transformed into a cuttlefish and shot ink into his eyes. Wordlessly, Thetis transformed back into her normal form and, with a smile, said that Peleus had won. He was hers. Peleus relaxed, and Thetis threw him off of her, and then she pinned him to the ground. The pair consummated their brand new relationship. Having learned of the plan, Hera insisted that Chiron host the wedding, and he did. Apollo and Poseidon were recalled from exile, and Zeus proclaimed an uneasy truce with the rest of the Olympians after their rebellion. They sat on twelve thrones overseeing the ceremony, and Zeus stopped being so salty that Thetis rejected his advances, and he gave her away at her wedding. Seeing as this was Chiron's place, the rest of the centaurs were expressly forbidden from drinking, which saved everyone from the scene that happened in episode 124, The Fall. Still, the wedding wasn't without its drama. Kind of ironic, actually. The wedding that was supposed to save the Greek world and the wars to come actually brought them about, because there was one person who wasn't invited, and... With one apple, Hera would learn her lesson. It's pretty understandable to not want the goddess of strife and discord at your wedding. You know, the one full of superpower beings that just got done trying to kill one another. In fact, I would imagine Eris, said goddess, gets invited to very few things. Maybe it's a vicious cycle, where when she doesn't get invited she gets more and more bitter, wanting to lead to more strife and discord, which, in turn, leads to her not getting invited to more stuff. Regardless, she heard about the wedding of Peleus and Thetis. Everyone did. The Olympians, wanting to one-up one another, brought gifts for the couple. Athena and Hephaestus went in together, on a spear. Athena provided the wood, and Hephaestus forged the blade. Zeus and Hera sent his suit of golden armor, which was as expensive as it was unpractical, because gold is one of the softest metals. Poseidon brought two immortal horses, which, yeah, that's what he brought to every wedding. He was the god of horses, after all, but everyone loved horses, so they gave him a pass. Peleus felt one more gift roll to a stop by his feet. He looked down and saw the solid gold apple, which, yes, was nice, but he had a gold suit, so whoever brought the apple should have gone first. Then, he noticed the inscription. 
it was one that would drop the world into a decade of war. If only he hadn't read it out loud. To the fairest. Huh, Peleus began, before inspecting the apple. Now, three women were next to him, standing arm in arm. The coup that happened on Olympus, though terrible, had done something positive in the end. It brought them together. Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite had more or less hated one another. Brought together by their mutual hate of Zeus, the three women were now closer than ever. Until they heard Peleus read that inscription. They became quiet and looked at Peleus. Well? Peleus was confused. Well, what? Well, who gets it? Aphrodite said with a wink, as if she already knew the answer. Who's the fairest? Peleus looked at the three most powerful women in the universe, standing before him. Oops, he said, dropping the apple. Aw, oh, dropped it. What? Chiron? Okay, uh, yeah, I'll be right over. Before any of the women could respond, Peleus had disappeared into the crowd, leaving the three looking down at the apple. Peleus stood before the city. The past few years have been good ones. The dowry from one of the ancient gods for marrying his daughter was massive. No surprise there. So Peleus was immediately back on his feet. He had a son, and now, according to Chiron, Zeus was going to give him back a throne. Or so Peleus thought. Peleus had been instructed to go to the city of Iolcus alone. There, he would find his army. Now, if you remember from the start of Peleus' story, Iolcus is where Peleus' wife was driven to suicide, and he was left to die by King Acastus. He arrived, donning his golden armor, and he stepped down from his horse to find... ants. Many ants. Thousands of ants marching toward the city. But no warriors. He sighed. It had been a good run. He had a few good years on the top of the world. But now the gods were messing with him again. Which was just fantastic, by the way. He nodded a sarcastic... Thanks, thanks a lot, up to the heavens, and turned to climb back atop his horse when he heard marching. He turned around, and there, on the ground, the ants had grown bigger. As they did, they thudded toward the city. By the time they reached the front gate, they were the size of humans. In their relentless march, they easily took the city before the defenders could even close the gates, because the warriors were ants until they were right up on the wall. Two ant warriors held King Acastus before Peleus put away the spear and took out his sword. Walking closer, Peleus asked Acastus if the king knew where he found the sword that day in the forest, after Acastus had left him for the centaurs. Peleus said that he didn't really use it all that much anymore. Pretty hard to get clean after that. Anyway, now he was going to stab King Acastus with it. And yes, he stabbed King Acastus with the poop sword, and King Acastus died. I can't imagine that the normal people cared all that much for who ruled over them. Whether it was the guy who left his friends to die, or the guy with the ant army, it probably had very little impact on their day-to-day -day life. Regardless, they declared Peleus king, and he became known as the king of the Myrmidons, which comes from the Greek word for ants. The ants, the Myrmidons, were not, like, big human-sized ants, but people who used to be ants. I don't know too much about them, other than the fact that they moved in the city that Peleus took over, and presumably, liked sweets and ruining picnics. I should also mention that I made a small continuity error when I mentioned Peleus in the Argonaut episodes. He wouldn't have been married to Thetis at that time, because he still would have been married to Antigone, his first wife, because she hadn't yet been driven to suicide by Acastus' wife, who wasn't yet king, because Medea hadn't tricked Jason's father's daughters into killing him yet. It's complicated, but I wanted to mention it. Antigone, but not the Antigone that's the daughter of Oedipus, isn't mentioned in a lot of sources. I wasn't super familiar with the story of Peleus, so I moved his backstory up a little farther than I should have. All that to say, we're finally at the point where we left Peleus after the Argonaut episodes. Peleus is approaching his son's room one day, a boy by the name of Achilles. Loosely, the name means, he who has people distressed. And that was absolutely true as Peleus opened the door. He'd heard the screams, and he had come running. Inside, he saw his wife, her face illuminated like a demon. She held the baby over the fire. The baby's face was red, and he was screaming so much he could hardly breathe. She was burning him. She was killing him. Without hesitation, Peleus ran. 
came back with a bucket and doused both the baby and the flame. Achilles was still screaming. And Thetis, though her face was no longer glowing in the firelight, glared at her husband. What had he done? Peleus summoned enough courage to face his wife, one of the immortal gods, and demanding what she had done. She was burning their child? She shook her head. Look at him. Look. Did it look like he had a single burn on him? No. She wasn't burning him. She was saving him. She was burning away the mortal parts of him. All the weakness that he had inherited from his father. Peleus looked down. Sure enough, Thetis was right. There wasn't a burn on Achilles. Even though the baby had been in the hottest part of the fire, he was unscathed. Still screaming, but unscathed. Thetis was still fuming, though. She said that they had one shot at this. One. And Peleus had put out the fire. Peleus was still shocked. Did, did it take? Was it enough? Thetis shook her head. She didn't know. They wouldn't know until the day came. If that day came. Peleus looked up at Thetis with worry in his eyes. This was all new to him. And he hadn't known. He was so sorry. Hastily, Thetis shoved the screaming baby into the new dad's arms. Not as sorry as he was going to be. In a flash, she was gone. Leaving Peleus alone with the screaming Achilles. She had left them both. She was gone. So, of course, there's another, more famous version of Achilles becoming immortal, where Thetis takes him to the river Styx and dips him in. As the myth goes, Achilles isn't completely immortal, since his mother was holding him by his heels and apparently couldn't bother to dip him twice, it left that one part exposed. The heel thing comes from the source called the Achilliad, which we will use parts of for our Achilles story. But despite the Styx origin story being more famous, the fire version told today, with Peleus accidentally interrupting the ceremony, is the earlier version, and calls his immortality into question. Since the heel isn't mentioned by Homer in the Iliad, this fits better with that version of the story. And, even though I said that this would be it this week, we really can't leave baby Achilles and baby Paris. And what about that golden apple with the inscription just sitting out there, leaving that burning question in the minds of the three goddesses? Next week, we'll be wrapping up this short prelude to the Trojan War. Real quickly, I want to mention that we have an online shop where you can get awesome t-shirts, stickers, and more, all while helping to support the show. For the shop, head on over to shop.bardic.fm. And there's also a membership thing on the site. For less than the price of a pound of ground lamb pancreas, you can get extra episodes, source pack ebooks, and ad-free versions of the show that are either more enjoyable or less enjoyable than lamb pancreas, depending on your opinion of lamb pancreas. And that's officially the most times I've said lamb pancreas in my life. Check out support.mythpodcast.com for more info on the membership. The creature this week is the Lady of the Land from Greek folklore. Now, the Lady of the Land is neither really a lady, nor on the land. She's a dragon who lives in a cave on the beach on the Greek Isle of Kos. She was transformed into a dragon by the Roman goddess Diana, which is basically the Greek goddess Artemis. We aren't told the reason, but the Greco-Roman pantheon never really needed a reason to transform an unfortunate young woman into a monster, did they? Regardless, this daughter of a local king was transformed into a dragon 100 fathoms in length, or about 200 yards, and what did this fearsome, hideous monster do? Nothing. Nothing at all. Unlike basically every dragon in folklore, she kept to herself. She didn't hurt anybody. She didn't even come out of her cave unless provoked. As far as hideous dragons go, this is really the one you want hanging around your island. There was one way to lift the curse and turn her back into a normal human. By kissing her on the mouth, as was described several times by Sir John de Mandeville, the writer who collected this story in the 16th century. There are two accounts of brave knights making their way to the dragon's lair to kiss the dragon on the mouth. The first got in there and found the dragon sleeping. He removed his helmet, and he just couldn't do it. The dragon was way too hideous. Waking to find a stranger there puckered up in front of her, the princess dragon snapped at him, grabbing him by the legs and beating him like a rag doll against a rock before throwing him and his horse into the ocean. 
neither were seen again. Much later, another handsomer, far more prudent knight arrived. I guess the princess could change back in the safety of her cave, because the knight snuck in to find her combing her hair. She caught his shadow, smiled, and the knight was enchanted by the beautiful maiden. She straight up said that she liked him, so she was going to let him lift the curse. One minor point, when he came back tomorrow to kiss her on the mouth, she would be in her dragon form. That was the whole thing. When he kissed her, he would get all of her dragon gold, be her husband, and they would be the rightful king and queen of the island. Taking a token of her affection, the knight pledged that he would be back the next day, kiss her, and free her. The next day, he took one look at the hideous dragon that warned him that she would be a hideous dragon, and he noped on out of there, rather than give it one kiss on its dragon mouth. It might be for the best that it didn't work out, though, because once the princess is restored to her normal form, she'll die within, like, a day, because, like I said, Greco-Roman mythology will never waste an opportunity to be cruel to a young woman. That's it for this week. Myths and Legends is by Jason and Carissa Weiser. Our theme song is by the band Broke for Free, and the Creature of the Week music is by Steve Combs. There are links to even more music in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.